growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, I remember the weeks leading up to Christmas were filled with kind of magic and mystery. Higby's shopping store or department store, Santa on the big chair, snow falling on public square, the great tree down there lit in the evening, slush cars sliding by. I was only vaguely aware that this was known as Advent season. And if I was only vaguely aware of Advent, I was completely unaware that Advent is its own season of preparation for celebrating the coming of the Lord on earth. My mom, of course, would get my brothers and me simple Advent calendars, much simpler, I think, than they have today, because our calendars had little pictures behind each window. You'd open it and you'd see a teddy bear, or you'd see a drum, or maybe a ball. We never got the sophistication of Advent candles. We never got there. Any understanding I might have had about Advent would, I think, get upended had I attended church, which I didn't do often enough, and noticed the readings in the first Sunday of Advent of suffering and apocalypse that introduced the season. If you too are not fully aware of Advent wreaths, have I got a project for you after church today. Down in the lower hall, we'll be making Advent wreaths. And the meaning of Advent changed for me over my lifetime, and it came more real relatively later in life. You see, I volunteered for the Samaritans of Boston, which is a suicide prevention hotline, and that showed me firsthand that as holiday music and lights begin to rise for some, for others, hearts and spirits can begin to sink, or sink more quickly than they do otherwise. And it was this discovery that gave me a lens through which I could reinterpret some of the shadows in Advent during my own growing up, adding another dimension to the season for me. The time of Advent becomes then a sort of shadowy time for some, which is made heavier by the presence of manufactured celebration and joy that the holidays so eagerly distribute around us. And in a shadowy time, God can feel far away, inattentive, or perhaps even complacent about whatever we're going through. Now, the writers of Hebrew Scripture describe frequently a sense of being abandoned by God, which they often chalked up to their own transgressions. In our address this morning with Isaiah, Addressing God, Isaiah asserts of God that you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. And our psalmist cries out, O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? In time of darkness, God can feel far away. And this, I think, is in line with at least my own experience Sometimes I want to cry, when, O God, will you act decisively again to show your love and the great plans you have for all of us? Our gospel reading this morning and our making, marking this Sunday as the first Sunday in Advent address this question, I believe. The gospel passage is often called part of Mark's little apocalypse a set of statements about what the end of time will be like and how they will be broadcast. The Greek word apocalypsis means just to reveal or to unveil. So when you hear the apocalypse, it's an unveiling. What's it all going to look like? And in our passage this morning, Jesus is revealing what's in store when the destination arrives. Now, Mark's whole 13th chapter assembles images of persecution, desolation, confusion, and turmoil that resolve themselves with the coming of the Son of Man. Early on in that chapter, Jesus offers these images as he and his four disciples gaze out over Jerusalem and the temple from the Mount of Olives. Now, from the Mount of Olives, you can actually see right in front of you that whole temple mount perched on top of that hill. The apostles had left the temple with Jesus earlier that day, and they were ooing and eyeing over its grandeur and all those big stones, and Jesus, 
who's clearly perturbed by all this in that part of the chapter, shoots back unequivocally that the temple and its stones will not survive the test of time or the ages. And it's not until they are overlooking the city that the four of them ask him for more clarity on the temple's future, thinking he had just made a statement in passing. Well, they've clearly touched on something because Jesus then launches into his extended version of this future. That's pretty scary and full of tribulation. And I can see the apostles looking at each other kind of uncomfortably, maybe furtively. Why did you ask me to tell him? Why didn't you tell him? I didn't want to tell him. He tells them that when the suffering has been endured, that he's described, the Son of Man will arrive with great power and glory to gather up the elect. And these words of his, Jesus promises, are going to outlive not just those stones that are so huge and glorious, but heaven and earth itself. So there is suffering to come. Where is God, we'll ask, and the suffering that you will endure in that he asks us to be aware and to keep alert because God will be there acting decisively at some point. And it's into this time of Advent, of darkness and isolation and of eager anticipation of the Messiah that we ourselves are asked to be aware and to keep alert. I remember seeing a card once that shows this crazy animal with a long neck saying, be alert, the world needs more alerts. Most scholars will believe that the Gospel of Mark provides a core text that the writers of Matthew and Luke had with them when they were writing their own Gospels. And those Gospels, Matthew and Luke, are dated following the destruction of the temple in the year 70, which happened during the first Jewish revolt against the Romans. So if this is true, maybe it's the case that the Gospel of Mark was written just before that destruction, during what is considered a persecution, the first one of Christians under the Emperor Nero in year 64. Now you'll remember Nero was the fellow that fiddled while Rome burned and then who blamed the fire on Jesus' followers. And maybe he did that to hide his own guilt for lighting this fire. And those were dark times for Jesus' followers and it would not be unusual for the events of that day, all that persecution and darkness and pain and suffering they were enduring to influence what the gospel writer was trying to say. The Spirit would, I think, turn the writer's heart that way, especially if what was happening was something that would be repeated over and over and over again in humanity's painful laboring toward the kingdom of God. So Advent is a time that marks anticipation. And for many, it's an eager anticipation of a parade coming around the corner. You can sort of hear it. Maybe you can feel it. You can't quite see it. And for others, it's the reluctant anticipation of shorter days and colder nights. And in both instances, whether darkness is giving its way to light or all is dark and we feel utterly helpless, what's left for us to do? Jesus' words come back to me. Keep alert. Watch and wait. Do this for Christ. Do this for each other. When we as persons and communities and nations in the world are used up and are out of sorts, when we are at our most vulnerable, individually or collectively, we are revealed, unveiled, unadorned. I may not have lost everything, not literally, or I might have found myself facing, I may not have found myself facing the astonishing trials of individuals or classes of people whose tragic stories are beyond my comprehension, but I have been in a place at times where I feel there is nothing of me worth saving, nothing of any value whatsoever. A place of such utter darkness and emptiness that nothing I can identify on earth feels worth the effort. It's hard to describe. And where do I turn when I'm feeling that way? What can possibly be worth taking another breath 
when you're in that spot. And at this place, I am at my most vulnerable, my most unadorned, my emptiest. I think our nation can lose its way too. Unadorned, empty, vulnerable. Its way and its purpose behind it, invisible. Ways and purposes that were at one time so clear. And maybe our world itself and our species too. In this place, human beings thus experience a sort of collective unveiling, a collective revealing. And it is in this place that our unveiling in sadness and God's unveiling in compassion, our revelation and God's revelation, our apocalypse and God's apocalypse meet, catch each other, and walk together. God acting decisively, albeit decisively with the touch of a still small voice or a star in the night sky, or even a baby sleeping. On this first Sunday of Advent, I invite us to be aware, to keep alert, and to watch. What will we do on our journey of Advent this year to do that? God acted decisively in bringing the Christ to us in a remote place a long time ago. We can watch and be aware for the Christ will come like a thief in the night or like a bridegroom who's adorned for a wedding banquet or like the master of the house home from travel. Be aware when you see others of their eyes diverted silently, eyes that yearn for healing, comfort, and the holy presence of God through your presence in their darkness. Be aware of your own apocalypse that God is near. Be aware of others' apocalypse that your relationship with them may just summon their own strength and courage enough to wait and watch this Advent. He will come like a late night phone call from a loved one. He will come like the courage to seek help and escape the violence that you have suffered or to escape the dependence to which you cling. He will come like a touch on your shoulder, reaching through cobwebs of silent despair. He will come like the restful sleep and quiet dreams that bring us alive and still able to function to the breaking day after a long and desperate night. Be aware and keep alert for the coming of God and for the coming of each other. Darkness will not overcome us if we are able to do this. Keep watch. Be present. Our problems may not disappear but if we invite and allow ourselves as individuals in communion with each other on our little island home, we will be able to detect that God is acting decisively today. We will know God is acting decisively in our world just as God acted decisively in the world 2,000 years ago when a Palestinian Jew born in occupied land in the Eastern Mediterranean raised his cry to the night that was for all the world then, as it is now and will be forever. The cry of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Amen.